We are in a series called Gain to Give, and this is the final weekend of that. And it's a fusion of two ideas, one of which is we need to learn to rest and spend time with some white space in our life instead of cramming it so full and learn how to come to God and to hold up our empty cups, learn how to renew and restore instead of just working hard and playing harder. And so we've talked about that, how God fills us up with strength and energy and purpose. And the goal of that is not just so that I can be more selfishly satisfied with my life, but the goal of that is so that I now have something to pour into the lives of others. And God gives us resources of finances and wisdom and skills and time. And the challenge now is how do I most effectively pour that out? And so we're going to look at some challenges from the Old Testament and the New Testament of times when people were challenged. And last week we talked about consistent generosity, what goes on week in and week out. And now we're going to talk about those special times when God touches our heart and says, I want you to step up and give a little something extra. And we're going to look at not only how we respond at those moments, but why do we respond like we do at those moments. So I want to do a little uh, reminder of why sometimes this is a hard thing. Every week we are bombarded with all kinds of appeals from good causes like save the pets to save the library to, oh man, that's a new car, I really need one of those, to people are starving around the world and how is that that we're we're okay with that and how do we make a difference there to, have you noticed that the ads get more interesting around Father's Day, guys? (laughs) Far more interesting and there's all kinds of invitations you get every week that say, spend here, give here, do this with your finances. And what I am encouraging us to do is just take a step back and ask the question, what am I doing to be a good steward of what God's given me? And just to do some evaluation from a biblical point of view and to then step forward in joy and give as unto the Lord. But part of the reason why it's a hard thing is because We get invitations all the time, and I don't know about you, but when you start giving to a few places, pretty quick your mailbox and your email box fill up with all kinds of other opportunities. I don't don't know if they put you on a soft touch list or what they do, but all of a sudden you get lots of possibilities, don't you? And it's easy, frankly, to get a little bit cynical, to think, oh yeah, just one more place looking for me to donate. And instead of stepping back and saying, This is a privilege God has given me, but where am I giving and why and how? How does it impact my heart? So we are looking at, uh, on the other side of your page there, just a review from what we talked about last week, is the Old Testament gave some very specific ways that they had to give. 10% of this, and then there were certain offerings, and then you have certain festivals that you have to keep. So it's all built into your week and your year. So it's very prescribed. It's very specific. And in the New Testament, God says to us, I want you to give with joy from your heart by grace. And for some people, they're like, whoa, that's way too vague. But the the truth is, is the things we see in the New Testament teach us that we're not under the Old Testament, but we're clearly founded on it. So that the mindset that God used all the way through the working with the nation of Israel should inform our thinking about how we give. And last week I challenged you with, why is it that our hearts turn to, oh, I don't have any specifics I have to give, so I'm going to make sure it's lower than that. Why, why do we move to give less out of love than we would out of law? And that's just an examining of our own hearts as we talk about the generosity. And part of it comes down to the insight that I gave you last weekend that money means different things to different people. It's a symbol, after all. You can't eat money. It doesn't keep you warm. It's really worthless except as a symbol. But the reason it's a difficulty in our marriages and in any kind of financial thing is because it means security to some and freedom to others, and and it's also a way of just luxury and enjoying more fun for me. And so it means different things, 
And we have to kind of understand the roots of that when we look at our own hearts and how it is that we get bombarded with materialistic messages and how that sinks in so easily and why. So I'm going to talk to you about three particular stories, three chances people had to give and how they responded in each of the chances. So first of all, this is the special appeals from the Old Testament. So let me give you a little bit of backstory. Uh, when Moses was sent down to take the children of Israel out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery, God promised them that they would be given great wealth. So how do slaves get wealth? Well, in a very strange way, it says that they were to ask their neighbors as they left, and their neighbors gave them gold and silver and clothing, specifically it mentions. And so they left 400 years of slavery rich. And I asked you to do some Bible study last week about where did that gold end up? They hadn't really earned it. God gave it to them as a special bonus gift. And what did they do with that? If you watch the stories over the next few years in their life, where did that gold go? So the first place that gold went is Moses had been up on Mount Sinai and it was like this incredible moment in Israel's history. They had seen the clouds on the mountain and lightning and they were not to touch the mountain and, and they had a clear vision of God's power and his holiness. And it took them exactly 40 days to decide that God wasn't moving fast enough, that Moses wasn't going to come back and they needed to take matters into their own hands. So here's the first appeal. When the people came to Aaron, Moses' brother, who was kind of the vice president of this organization, so in Moses' absence, they came to him. And when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That's 40 days, remember? And Aaron answered, Take off your gold earrings from your wives and your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. That was the first appeal. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron, and he took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then he said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. So God gave them the special bonus after they had seen the plagues, after they had seen God's power on the mountain, and it took them exactly 40 days to invest this gift in a calf. And, and they did this not just in a calf, but it was a calf that they now said, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. How do you think God felt about that? You know, the scripture says that God is a jealous God. And it doesn't mean that he's an over-jealous God. It means that we belong to him. And anytime we start flirting with other idols, he's jealous. And so they said, these are the gods that brought us out of Egypt. And then Aaron said to them, we are going to have a celebration to the Lord all around this golden calf. So why did they make a gold into an idol looking like a calf. So this was the first place, is the gold that they got as a special gift went into idols. And I was thinking about this context. They were slaves, you remember? Do you think slaves wore gold earrings? So for a very short period of their time, they were given these gold things, and they were wearing them in the desert. I'm not sure what the occasion was, but they're wearing them while they're camping in the desert. And here's the first chance they have. And Aaron says, you want an idol? Bring me your gold. And they responded, not all of them, but a lot of them responded and said, okay, we're going to take that. And they had enough gold to make a calf. Now, the calf god, Apis, was a famous god in Egypt. They had been for 400 years in an idol-worshiping culture. And I think Israel always struggled with the fact that God is an invisible God. Everybody around him had a tangible, visible, you know, shaped in the image of an animal or a person or something that they could bow down to and worship and put food in front of. And God said in the first commandments, in the Ten Commandments, 
you will have no graven images. I don't want anything. <laughs> I don't want to be represented by a cow. Thank you very much. And Israel was always looking for that, that image, that picture of God. And some have suggested that perhaps they weren't even saying we're rejecting God. They actually said we're going to have a celebration to the Lord. And if you notice in your Bible, in, in Exodus chapter 32, it says we're going to have a celebration to the Lord. And it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Now, a little Bible study note here. In the Old Testament, there's two primary words in Hebrew for the Lord. And the word Adonai is kind of a more general term. You could use it for, for even somebody in a high position, like a, a royalty. You could talk about being a master. So it was a more generic word, meaning Lord. And in your Bible, it's capital L, small O-R-D. But when it uses capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, it represents the covenant name that God gave to Moses. And we pronounce it probably closest in Hebrew as Yahweh. And so Yahweh, or it's been transliterated, transliterated into English as Jehovah, that was the covenant name of God. And what Aaron said is we're going to build a calf, but we are going to worship Yahweh. So they were taking the idol worship of their past and they were mixing it with this worship of God. And they were saying, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. And how did God feel about that? He was angry. I know we talk about God's grace and his love, which is very, very true. It's why we're all still here. <laughs> But God was also very stern and angry about things that were wrong. And God said when he saw them doing this, get out of the way, Moses, I'm going to wipe them out. And Moses pled with God not to do that. What will the nation say if you brought us out here into the desert just to kill us? And, and God says, well, I'll start over you with you, Moses. <laughs> and then he relented. And he forgave them. And then Moses came down the mountain. And then he got angry. He comes down and he says, it sounds like there's a battle going on. And not only had they worshipped this calf, but it says they'd got up and indulged in revelry. They were having a wild party. And in fact, the King James says nakedness is involved. So it was a wild party based on the, the other kinds of worship. And Moses got so angry, he threw down the tablets, and then he said, whoever's going to follow God, stick with me. And the Levites stuck with him, and they followed God. And there was, there was judgment that came. There was a horrible thing. But there's a really important verse I want to read you. So this is out of uh, Exodus 32. And it says, when Moses approached the camp, or verse 19, and he saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned, and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And then he took the calf the people had made and he burned it in the fire and he ground it into powder and he scattered it on the water and he made them drink it. So, first answer to the question, where did that gold end up? It was in the outhouses. <laughs> he said, I'll show you your God. Gold is worthless, it's not a god, it's not powerful. He ground it up and he made his point clear. This is not the god that brought us out of Egypt. So the gift that God had gave them, they squandered it on idol worship and it ended up coming to nothing. That's a powerful lesson, I think, for us. And then I was thinking as I was looking through that image of the calf, as I was studying up on that, there was another image that came up. And it was a gift to the city of New York to represent prosperity and strength and financial wholeness. And it stands in front of the New York Exchange. And it is the bull. So have we come very far from worshiping a golden cow? I think there's some great similarities there. So... That was the first option. 
and God forgave them, and there was judgment, and there was difficulty. And then Aaron goes, or excuse me, Moses goes back up the mountain, and God not only gives him another set of the Ten Commandments, he tells him how to actually bring the worship of God into something concrete without having an idol. They didn't have an image to worship, but God gave them a place to worship. A place where he said, I've made my name dwell. So here's the next appeal. Moses said to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Capital O-R-D, you see this all through here? Everyone who is willing to bring to the Lord an offering of gold and silver and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen, goat hair and ram skins dyed red and another type of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and the breastpiece. He said, I am giving you a chance a special appeal that your money can go to the creation of a worship center and a worship process. And God gave very, very specific directions about how they were to build an altar and how they were to have a table to put out food in the presence of God. Not that God would eat it, but this was a bread of the presence. And it says the ephod and the breast piece. You probably don't know what those are, but the high priest had a very, very special outfit and he had a special thing that he wore on the top part of his body. And in the middle of that was a golden piece with 12 stones in it, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And they were precious stones. And I thought, what a wonderful picture. If I went out of Egypt and my neighbor gave me a sapphire or a ruby, and when the call came to be involved in a worship center, I looked at that and keeping it as something beautiful for myself. Or what if I gave it to God? And when you went to worship and you saw the high priest had your ruby in the middle of his breast piece as he was offering sacrifices to God, would that make you feel invested in the, in the work that God was doing? You see, what happens when we give, we get connected to what we give to. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there is your heart. And conversely, where your heart is, there goes your treasure. And he is giving them an opportunity to build this building that's called the tabernacle or the sanctuary. And it was meant to be a temporary mobile worship center. And temp by temporary, I mean they used it for almost 400 years. <laughs> so they used it for a long time. And this was the place and the way that they worshiped. And people got to be a part of bringing those gifts to God. The third appeal and the third story I want to give you is from the New Testament. And it's a different kind of opportunity. The backstory is in Jerusalem, there were believers who were there that were persecuted and they were impoverished and they were struggling even to live. And so Paul went around to the new churches in the city of Corinth and Galatia and different places around in Asia Minor. And he was encouraging them to give to their spiritual center, to Jerusalem, and to give to the people there. And Paul says it like this in the first book of Corinthians. There's going to be a great time for you to give when there's a time of great need in the body of Christ. And so that great need specifically was starving and hurting people. And he says about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, so according to what you have, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men that you approve, and I will send them with your gift to Jerusalem. So he sets up this process where he says, I don't want to come and be the money collector. There's a big need here. I want you, every time you meet on the first day of the week, I want you to put some money aside. I want this to be a process that comes out of your heart. So three appeals. Give money for a golden calf. Give money for a worship center. Give money for some fellow Christians who are in deep need. Now let's just go back and look at those scenarios and say, how did people respond? And we saw, of course, the responses when it came to the worship of God through the idol and the calf, and they gave up their gold. So the second group 
those who didn't give their gold, they still had a chance to give to the worship center. Think about it. The ones who had given their gold to the idol no longer had anything to give to the worship of God. It's kind of an either or. And so here's the response. Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Aholiab. These are two guys that God selected to do the craftsmanship on the worship center. And it says, And every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work, and they received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of the construction of the sanctuary. So people were bringing gold and silver and brass, and they were bringing yarn and leather. So all kinds of opportunities. And then God gave these skilled people the ability to step up and sew and weave and cast and do the things that it took to make it. And here's what happened. The people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and they said to, the Mo- to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord has commanded to be done. We are getting inundated. We can't even get our work done because so many people are bringing it. This is usually a passage pastors have underlined. And it says, And Moses gave an order, and they sent word throughout the camp, No man or woman is to make anything else an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more. It's the only time this ever happened in the history of the world. (laughs) Not true. But I want you to see why. I think they had seen God power on the mountain. I think they had seen God's judgment on the idol. I think they were so aware that they had been given grace and had been spared. And when you are so aware, when we sing songs about God's freedom and his love and his being a father, and when you experience that, that that it unlocks something inside of us different than a heart-tugging appeal. There's this response that says, God, out of all that you've given me, I want the privilege of giving to you. And they gave with reckless abandon. And I think they gave with great joy. And so the work was not only done, he said, can you stop these people? They're crowding the room we're trying to work in. And so he stopped them. And the gold that came from Egypt either went to the idol or it went to the worship center. I think that's a powerful, I'd never really thought that through. That's the only two places we see gold after that. And those are the places where God gave it to them so they could invest, either in idol worship or in worship of God. And then as we move to the New Testament, so, so you see what they had as an overflowing offering. And, and I wanted you to see that word in there too where he says these were the free will offerings. In other words, they had already given their normal giving. This wasn't instead of their tithe. This was because of God's work they wanted to give more. And I've seen that in operation. I remember clearly a Mexico trip that I was on, and uh, it was involving several families and adults. And, and when people go on a Mexico trip, they have to come up with a certain amount of money for that. And so either they're paying it out of their pocket or they're asking other people to give, and they're, and they're taking that with them. They've already traveled. They've given up their spring break, usually. They've t- traveled a 1,000-plus miles down there, which is nobody's idea of a good time. And then we worked, in this case, we were working on the, putting a roof on a church, and they worked hard, and it was hot. And you think it would be easy at that point to say, I have given sacrificially. I have given as much as I can. And towards the end of the week, um, we gathered around at lunch, and they had been so kind, they'd kicked us lunch every day. And, and the pastor said, could we pray for this family here? And there was a, a youngish couple that were there. And he said, the, the wife has got some serious health issues. And they can't take her to the hospital because they don't have any money. And so we're just praying that God would heal her. And I remember in that moment, one of the guys in the circle said, how much would it cost to take her to the hospital? And he said, oh, about $300. And there was this, immediate move of God's spirit and people's hearts who had already given so much. And somebody just took off their hat and they started passing it around. 
And people took out the money that they were going to use for the lunch money on their way home. They took out money that they were going to use to buy souvenirs down there. And they put it in the hat. And you know what was cool about it? Is the joy that came out of that. Yeah, we, we were able to provide because we're far wealthier than they were. And the need was so small compared to what we would say going to the hospital would cost. But more than that, God moved people's hearts. And there was this sort of this sense of this was an important moment and we got to be here. And you know, there's a lot of times you spend $20 or $50 and you have buyer's remorse afterwards. And this is the opposite. This is giver's joy that comes out of that. I, I see that going on in the scriptures as well. In the New Testament, when Paul is saying, We need to take a collection because there's some brothers and sisters who were starving to death in Jerusalem and that's not okay. And so he's challenging the church at Corinth and he uses an example of the church at Macedonia, the church in Greece. He says, I want you to know what God moved them to do as you're thinking about what God wants you to do. So let me cut in here in in 2 Corinthians. This is the second letter he writes to them. In the midst of a very severe trial, the Macedonian Christians, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. I don't know if you've thought about what this mathematical formula would really read like. If somebody's in a severe trial and they have extreme poverty, what would you think would come out of that? A nice card. Sympathy for you. You're going through a tough time. But it said because of their overflowing joy... It resulted in rich generosity. I I long for that for all of us, to have those times when God's joy so fills us that we are generous in a way, not out of an appeal, not out of obligation, but generous out of joy. Just because God blesses us and has been so merciful and so good. And so then it says, I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege in sharing in this service to the Lord's people. He said, when you're thinking about giving, I want you to think about how much God has moved your heart. And he said, I I want you to experience that overflowing joy. That in spite of the difficulties of your life, in spite of the faith that it requires to trust God that, that enough will be enough, that he moves you in specific times and specific ways to say, I want to experience that joy of giving. And this passage I mentioned to you last week, same, same uh, place in 2 Corinthians, it says that God loves a cheerful giver. Why? Because God is a cheerful giver. And he wants us to experience that overflow, that joy, that that enjoyment of him that results in wanting to do something for his work. And I remind you that verse that Jesus gave us last week we mentioned, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all those things that that the pagans run after, how to take care of yourself, how to have security, how to have enough purpose and joy in your life. He said, I will take care of those. My challenge to you is that you keep your focus on What is it that moves God's kingdom forward? And sometimes those are individual gifts. Sometimes those are part of what family church is doing or part of what some other organization is doing. But what I want you to ask yourself is, have I allowed the materialism of my culture? Have I allowed my desire for security? Have I allowed my addiction to luxury to take over so that I don't experience that joy. Because I read a great comment that said, the only, the only remedy for materialism is giving. To get rid of, to be a part of something, to see my life as a small piece of a big thing that God is doing. And so this is, I think, an awesome opportunity for you and I to examine our lives. And one of the things that I know is I've had lots of appeals over the years And at times, you give to something that you feel passionate, but after a while, you're just kind of keeping going because that's what you do. And I remember having a conversation with somebody, and they said, I need to think about my giving because I'm giving here and here and here and here and here, and I'm giving a a little bit to a whole bunch of places that I don't 
Some of them, frankly, weren't kingdom work at all. And they said, I I need to think about this. And I thought, boy, what a great question. Am I giving because God's tapped my heart? Am I giving out of joy? Am I giving to things that are making a difference for the kingdom of God? Or did I just get caught in a soft moment from somebody who was appealing, touched my heartstrings, and now for the next hundred years I'm giving 30 bucks a month to something? And so I think this is a great time for us to step back and examine what am I already giving? Am I giving effectively? Am I giving, in fact, here's the way I would say it, is my giving spirit-led and is it making an eternal impact? Do I feel great about the places God has called me to give? And am I doing so with joy, with overflowing joy? Because sometimes even if you're passionate about it, it's gotten to be just the same old thing. It's just what I do. It's auto pay, for example. And we lose that joy and that passion and that desire to see God pour into me and for me to pour that out. And it certainly includes our time and our skills. Frankly, for people who have money, sometimes the cheapest thing you can do is write a check. (laughs) That's easy. I'll give you a check and I'm done. Harder? You want me to help with VBX? Whoa, that's a bigger commitment. So for some people, time and skill and effort is the generous gift. For some people, finances is the generous gift. And I think God wants us to experience both. But my desire for you and I is that we would experience God's joy and that we would give in a God-directed, spirit-led way, and that we would experience that bleeding off of materialism that says, God, this is for you. I'm going to hand off to the South Umpqua. I'm going to hand off to Green and uh, Sky and Will. You guys walk through, or I guess it's uh, Bob that's our campus pastor in South Umpqua this weekend. And you guys walk him through these next couple questions. Are you giving to kingdom impact? Are you giving of your time? Are you giving of your energy? Are you giving of your finances? Are you giving to things that make a difference for the kingdom of God? Or have you slowly gotten involved in all kinds of things that really are not making much difference at all? So it's a time of evaluation, a time of reflection. A time of asking yourself those questions of not only what am I giving, but why am I giving? Does it it move people towards God in some way? And I know that there's a lot of ways that you can give to do that. And I also think sometimes we feel like I have no resources. What could I do that makes a difference? And, you know, some very simple thing like including God in your will in some way where you're giving something when you're gone that you can make a difference for something that's going to move the kingdom forward. And I want this to be just a short moment of evaluation of God, am I doing what you've called me to? Do I experience the joy? Am I giving out of a full heart? And am I making a difference? Because I feel like we need to stop every now and then and take a look and say, what am I doing? And why and how? And then the challenge would be, let me encourage you, in light of God's goodness to us, just make a gift of some kind this week. Make a commitment, make a gift. Maybe it's something spontaneous that just comes up as you go through the week. I've got a couple of friends that actually put a part of their money in a generosity fund in their own account, and they have some money that they're looking to give away, and they're just looking for those opportunities. So it's already earmarked. They're just looking for those opportunities. It makes you look at things differently. And I think that's a beautiful picture of generosity and joy. Let's close in prayer, shall we, at this message time. Father, thank you for how much you love us and how much you've given us. And we are like the Egyptians, or like the Israelites who came out of Egypt. Lord, you have blessed us beyond what we have earned and you have poured into us. And so we come and we ask you for that joy, that overflowing joy, that that sense of purpose, that, that sense of direction, that, God, you would challenge us to not be dominated by the materialism of our culture, not worshiping the golden calf, and not dominated even by the appeals that come that 
are so cleverly crafted to make us want to give, but that we're led by your Spirit. We're doing it with a full heart, and God, we're doing it as an act of worship to you, to tell you that we love you, to tell you thanks for being a great Father. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.